Hi, Steph again. I'm back with my second review of books by Frieda McFadden that I read this week. Um, and this video is about The Housemaid. So The Housemaid is one of the most popular books in the Facebook group that I'm in for readers of psychological thrillers, um, which again, the author is also a part of that group. So people tend to be very nice about her books. Um, this book, like, like the other one by her that I read, The Inmate, is a relatively short book. I read it in just like a couple of days. Um, and I'm going to spoil pretty much everything about this book. Like I said in my video for The Inmate, I would rather give you like an in-depth discussion about the book rather than just a review that doesn't spoil anything. So if you don't like spoilers, maybe go read the book and then come back and watch. Okay, so first of all, the blurb for the book on Goodreads is inaccurate, which really annoys me. So this is what it says, quote, Welcome to the family, Nina Winchester says as I shake her elegant manicured hand. I smile politely, gazing around the marble hallway. Working here is my last chance to start fresh. I can pretend to be whoever I like, but I'll soon learn that the Winchester's secrets are far more dangerous than my own. Every day I clean the Winchester's beautiful house top to bottom. I collect their daughter from school and I cook a delicious meal for the whole family before heading up to eat alone in my tiny room on the top floor. I try to ignore how Nina makes a mess just to, just to watch me clean it up. How she tells strange lies about her own daughter and how her, her husband Andrew seems more broken every day. But as I look into Andrew's handsome brown eyes so full of pain, it's hard not to imagine what it would be like to live Nina's life. The walk-in closet, the fancy car, the perfect husband. I only try on one of Nina's pristine white dresses once just to see what it's like, but she soon finds out. And by the time I realize my attic bedroom door only locks from the outside, it's far too late. But I reassure myself the Winchesters don't know who I really am. They don't know what I'm capable of. So this is this. The, there are a couple things in this that are just wrong. So the main character, her name is Millie. She discovers that the attic door locks from the outside pretty much immediately after moving in with the Winchesters. And second, she tries on a dress because Nina gives it to her. Um, and third, she doesn't pick up their daughter every day from school. This kind of thing drives me bananas because it's just shoddy work written to sensationalize the book. But these are not the way that things happen in the book. Um, it's kind of like when you watch a movie trailer and then the trailer has scenes that don't even make it into the movie. So I don't know who writes these blurbs. I don't know if it's the author or the publisher, but it's weird to have multiple discrepancies right from the get go. I feel like that's just dumb. So this book opens with someone expecting to be arrested because the police are there and there's a dead body in the attic, but we don't know who anybody is at that point. And then the story begins from Millie's point of view. And Millie is a recently released from prison parolee who served 10 years for murdering a boy when she was 17. The boy in question was assaulting, maybe raping her friend, and she attacked his head with a paperweight because apparently those are still a thing that exists and they're kept in the dorm bedrooms of college boys, <laughs> but whatever. So Millie is finally released from prison and she had a job at a bar, but after punching a coworker who kept sexually harassing her, she was fired. She's been living in her car and these are things that she has to keep a secret from her parole officer. You can't uh, lose your job and you can't be homeless, I guess. So she interviews for the job as the housemaid and, and sometimes babysitter for Nina Winchester who is the wife of multi-millionaire dreamboat Andrew Winchester, also called Andy. Um, along the way, she crosses paths with Enzo, the Italian landscaper, who seems to be trying to warn her of some danger, but he doesn't use more than like one word at a time to do so, so it's very ineffective. So the interview seems to go fine, and eventually, of course, Millie gets the phone call that Nina wants her to start the next day. So Millie is shown to her room, which is a tiny attic space at the very top of the house with only one small window that's painted shut and she has a little cot to sleep on. Um, she also has a mini fridge with three small water bottles in it and that's gonna matter later. She notices, um, like I said, almost immediately that the door locks from the outside. So she asks Nina for the, t for the key and eventually Nina gives her one. Although I don't know if we ever see it again, so I don't know what Millie did with it. Um, 
Nina seems completely insane. The house is a disaster. She accuses Millie of making messes she didn't make and of throwing papers away that Millie never touched and of not following instructions that Nina never gave and other things like that. So she also goes through Millie's personal things and accuses her of trying to poison her daughter with peanut butter, which is in the cupboard. And Nina hadn't thought to tell Millie about her daughter's allergies, but of, but of course she claims that she had. Um, Nina's daughter, Cecilia or Cece, is a straight up brat. She wears only these frilly dresses that make her look like a creepy doll. Um, Nina's behavior just gets worse and worse and Millie begins to hear rumors that Nina had spent time in the mental hospital. She finds out that Nina was locked up after trying to drown Cece after drugging both Cece and herself. Um, but Millie sticks it out because even the tiny cot in the attic room is better than sleeping in her car. And over time she begins to see how unhappy Andrew is in his marriage. And as Nina's behavior worsens, Andrew and Mir Millie start like flirting a bit. And of course they feel this electric chemistry that they can't resist, blah, blah, blah. So Andrew really wants to have children. The fertility doctor tells Nina, tells them that Nina can't have any more children. And he's like genuinely devastated by this news. So about halfway through the book, I guess, um, Nina leaves overnight to take Cece to summer camp and leaves Andrew and Millie alone. So just prior to this, um, Andrew had asked Millie to arrange a Broadway show in a fancy hotel in the city uh, to like help Nina feel better about the infertility news. And um, Nina had told her what weekend would work. So she booked it. And then it turns out that that was the weekend Nina was going to be gone. And so uh, Andrew talks Millie into going with him to see this Broadway show. And Millie, of course, having grown up without a lot of money and stuff, has never seen a Broadway show. So she's just totally enchanted. Um, so <laughs> they drive into the city, they see the show, and then they go to dinner at a fancy restaurant and they drink too much wine, especially Andrew drinks too much wine. Um, he, they also still had the reservations at the hotel. So they decide to stay in the city and take a cab to the hotel and of course they start making out in the cab and they decide to just have the one room instead of getting two at the hotel so they sleep together of course and the next day they drive back to the house Nina comes back and shortly after she has this big hissy fit and Andrew tells her he doesn't love her anymore they're gonna get a divorce so she should just leave so she does she goes to stay in a hotel and at this point the book shifts to Nina's perspective and we go back a little bit in time and when I say shifts I mean it really shifts like her section is actually broken up a bit differently than Millie's chapters which I really liked Nina's section starts with the heading how to get rid of your sadistic evil husband and then there are like subheadings about what she did with her life that got her where she is so that that was kind of cool I like that um, Nina's section is all about showing the reader who Andrew really is and what he has done to her so Nina, before she met Andrew, got pregnant in a one night stand and she dropped out of college to raise Cece. Nina was an orphan and she didn't really have anyone. And so when her, so, you know, eventually she got this job um, shortly after Cece was born. She was still nursing her at the time. And Andrew Winchester was her boss's boss. And he started paying attention to her one night and she fell in love with him really quickly, of course. Andrew's gorgeous, he's sweet, he was patient, he seemed really interested in Nina and her daughter. They dated only a short time and then they got married very quickly. So she, along the way she finds out that he had been previously engaged to a woman named Kathleen. But she doesn't learn anything more than that at first. So three months into their marriage, Andrew's true character starts to come out. Um he tricks her into going up to the attic with him where he promptly locks her in the little room. There's the cot, the mini fridge with the three small water bottles and an empty bucket in the closet. Andrew says that he's unhappy with Nina because she has let her roots start to show in her hair and that that's unacceptable. So in the blink of an eye, Andrew goes from being this doting, loving husband to being controlling, abusive and like sadistic. He tells Nina that the attic is soundproofed, of course, and then eventually he says that hair is a privilege and he will let her out after she removes 100 hairs from her head 
and all 100 hairs have to show that they've been pulled out by the root. So he makes, uh, so she does this and she passes them to him under the door in an envelope and he looks at them and he says, you know, uh, one strand of hair doesn't have root attached so you have to start over. And she ends up locked in the attic room for like two nights, I think, and he says that his mother is watching Cece all that time. So eventually he lets her out and he gives her a glass of water, but the water has been drugged and so she just crashes and uh, he sends her a series of texts while she's out cold and um, saying that he's worried about her and then he calls the police. So just as Nina drags herself into the bathroom and finds Cece laying in the bathtub, also drugged, and the water's filling, um, the police arrive just in time to save her and Cece. And then, of course, Nina is committed to the mental hospital for, I think, eight months. And she's given prescriptions and the doctors are convinced she hallucinated the things that Andrew did to her in the attic. This is all setting, this is all Andrew setting up a situation that will prevent Nina from leaving him. If she leaves, he will use his money and influence to convince everyone that Nina is insane and then have Cece taken away from her and all of that. So there's this threat kind of hanging over her all the time and there's no escape. So she's released from the hospital and they go home where Andrew's mother is with Cece. Uh, Andrew's mother's name is Evelyn. And Evelyn mentions that he had left a light on in the house. And Nina wants to just avoid anyone being angry, so she apologizes and says it was her fault, even though it wasn't. Her therapist had told her that she should go up to the attic to face her fears, and so she stupidly goes up there with Andrew, who locks her in again, and this time in the dark, for having left a light on. So before he lets her out this time, he mentions that he got he's got... Um, uh, hidden cameras and he can watch her so she won't be able to get away with anything. So time passes and Nina mentions that she's disciplined in the attic about once a month and if Cece does anything Andrew doesn't like then Nina is punished for it. Um, he's the reason that Cece wears the creepy doll fancy dresses even though all the other kids are wearing kids clothes. Uh, one time he even made Nina pepper spray herself in the face with her eyes held open. Um, Eventually, Nina confides in Enzo, the landscaper, who offers to kill Andrew or do whatever he can to help her escape the situation, and they start to work on an escape plan. But, of course, Andrew finds her safe deposit box that has passports for her and Cece and money and stuff. So, so Nina comes up with this new plan. She decides she needs to find a replacement. And she hires Millie as a maid, and then, of course, she acts completely insane, until Andrew throws her out and starts his affair with Millie. And before you assume she's just throwing Millie to Andrew without thinking it through, no, no. Nina actually hired a private investigator who told her all about Millie's past. So Nina's plan is to hire her, let Andrew seduce her, and then hope that Millie will kill him for her. So the story then flips back to Millie's point of view, and we get a short insert from Nina in between each of Millie's chapters from here to the end. Um, having returned... From the city with Nina gone, Millie thinks everything's just hunky-dory with her and Andrew. And then one night she goes up to get her things from the attic room and move them downstairs. And Andrew follows and they get romantic on the little cot. And when she wakes up, she's locked in the attic room. Andrew tells her that she left a couple of his books out on the coffee table. And books are a privilege. She apologizes and says, well, let me out and I'll go put them away. And he's like, no, no. I will let you out after you, and then he has her lie down flat on her back, and he has left her with three huge heavy books, and she has to balance those heavy books on her stomach for three hours. She first has to pee, so she ends up having to do that in the bucket. And eventually she lies down and puts the books on her stomach, and at first she doesn't think she can do it, but Andrew's not going to let her out until the books have been on her stomach for three hours, so she does it. He decides that she removed the books one minute too early, so she has to start over and do it again, um, which she manages to do. She actually keeps him there for 10 extra minutes the second time. And then Andrew enters the room and sits next to her on the cot, and he's showing her the feed of the camera in the room to his phone. Um, he's, you know, he's giving her the lay of the land. This is how it is. So she pulls 
pepper spray from her pocket and she sprays him full in the face. She grabs his phone and she escapes, locking him in the room. The pepper spray had been left in the bucket for her by Nina, which is, I thought that was good. I thought that was a really good little trick. Um, Andrew, of course, freaks out, tries to break down the door, but he's not successful and he's the one who built this room, so he should have known. Um, and so Millie begins torturing him much in the way he did her and Nina before her. She leaves him in the room, eats a sandwich, answers a text from his mother on, on his phone. Um, when she goes back upstairs, Andrew apologizes and she tells him he needs to be disciplined. She tells him he has to put, he has to lie down and put those three books on his, um, groin area and lie there for three hours. She goes downstairs and she starts mentally like putting things together about Nina. She then goes up and she tells Andrew he misheard her and she had said the books needed to stay in place for five hours so he would have to start over. He offers her money, like $2 million, but she refuses, which I think was smart. She's a lot smarter protagonist than the one in the inmate. Um, because of course, if you let him out, he's going to overpower you and, and it's going to be bad. So in the meantime, Nina has picked up Cece at summer camp and she and Enzo are working out what they need to do next. In a moment of uh, what I thought was kind of extreme cruelty, Millie goes back upstairs and she tells Andrew that the feed didn't go through all night, but instead of making him do the books again, she pushes a set of pliers under the door and she tells him that he needs to pull out one of his teeth, which he proceeds to do. And she tells us that this is only the beginning. So Nina arrives at the house. She has left Cece with Enzo and she like has to find out how Millie has handled things. She's nervous. Of course, she sees that the light is on in the attic and she's terrified to find Millie in the room and that things had not worked out the way she was hoping. So she runs up to the attic, she unlocks the door and she finds Andrew and he's dead on the floor and he's missing multiple teeth. They're out like, you know, bloody gross on the floor. Millie comes up behind her and at first things are like all tense and then they have a chat and Nina tells her to leave and she will take responsibility for Andrew's death when the police come. So Millie leaves and then we circle back to the opening scene of the book and it's Nina that's waiting for the police to arrest her as they are upstairs investigating Andrew's dead body. And the story she tells is that he must have gotten locked in the attic by accident and starved to death while she was away. So as luck would have it, and this is one of the less plausible elements, but you know, it's fiction. As luck would have it, one of the policemen happens to be the father of the girl that almost married Andrew before Nina came along. And he knew something wasn't right about Andrew. And he happens to be well enough connected that he is going to let Nina go and she doesn't face prosecution or any charges. I don't think that's how the law really works, but in fiction, I guess sometimes it does. So they have a wake for Andrew. Um, and his parents come in and his father, you know, tells Nina that if, he, if she ever needs anything, they're there for her. And then he leaves the room. And Evelyn, Andrew's mother, tells Nina that she knows about Andrew's missing teeth. And Evelyn says basically that if he wasn't taking care of them, then he needed to learn a lesson as teeth are a privilege. Um, she even mentions that when she pulled out one of his baby teeth with pliers, she thought he had learned that lesson and how it was a shame that he never learned it. And it was good that Nina was willing to teach him that lesson. <laughs> so that tells you what you need to know about Andrew's childhood. Um, the epilogue is about Nina and Cece having this great life together. They're free of Andy, but they have his money. And uh, Millie is being interviewed to be hired by another abused wealthy housewife um, with a shining recommendation from Nina Winchester. So while I enjoyed this book for the most part, uh, I do have just a couple of complaints. The biggest of which is why didn't Nina give Millie any money? Like she just gives her a letter of recommendation. I mean, she's now worth m multiple millions of dollars. Um, and the company that Andy ran is presumably still bringing in more wealth. So she basically, without telling her, hired Millie to kill her husband. And when she did, that set Nina free and she didn't throw some of the money that over her way. I just was like, I kind of expected that that was what was going to happen, that she'd have this bank account. <laughs> Surprise, you know, you're also free now, but 
she didn't. So, okay. Um, secondly, although the story is compelling and it's surprising, uh, if you haven't read the, the other books out there that are similar to this one, apparently there are a couple of other books that are really similar. Um, the characters do feel a bit underdeveloped. It's a short book. So I guess there wasn't a lot of time for character development, and maybe that's for the best. Um, I I believe that Frieda McFadden is a self-published author, and and so the, and the writing is just a tad amateurish. I did think this was a lot better than the Inmate, though. Um, she has developed her writing skills over the years. I would say um, these are the only two of her books I've read so far. I'm going to read a couple more and just see what I think. Uh, because again, she's like enormously popular on this Facebook group and on Goodreads and stuff. So, um, I, that being said, like, I think it would be really cool to be a really successful author, regardless of whether my books would be slightly amateurish or not. So I can't fault her too much. I, I, you know, I envy her, her career. So, <laughs> so good for you, Frida. And I'm glad that, that, from my perspective, it looks like the writing has matured a little bit. This was definitely a better book, I think, than The Inmate. Um, there's a sequel to The Housemaid coming out, which I assume will continue Millie's adventures in saving abused wealthy women from their husbands, but I'm not sure. I don't know. Um, so I like this book. I don't know if I would read it again necessarily, but it was really good enough for a quick read on a cold winter day. Uh, one of the best things about Frida's books is that they are short. And so, you know, if you don't totally love it, you're not committing for days and days and days. <laughs> so, but I did like it. I liked The Housemaid. And like I said, I'm going to read a couple of her other books and I'll let you know what I think. So thanks for watching. If you like this video, click like. Maybe you think about subscribing and all that other YouTube stuff. Uh, and I'll see you in the next video.